Well, let's continue in the book of Jude. Jude chapter 1, because there's only one chapter to Jude. We'll do a little bit of just catching ourselves up here, and, and we'll just kind of start from the beginning uh, of the book. Jude, as we mentioned on Sunday, I think this is the first time where we've given half of a, a study on Sunday and half of Wednesday, kind of unique circumstances, but, but uh, man, it was so timely, it seemed like, too. And uh, um, as we mentioned, the Lord wants to use all things, and so uh, I certainly think it was good and, and profitable, and uh, that said, I'm looking forward to Revelation this coming Sunday, but um, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus and the brother of the author of the book of James, and he's writing to Christians, and he is informing them, drawing attention to the fact and the seriousness that there is a very real threat to them, that there is apostates, false teachers. There are those coming into the church that don't want the best for the bride. They don't want the best for the Lord. They don't want the best for the church. And in lots of different ways, he's going to talk about how they're self-seeking and they're, and they're out for themselves. And, and, and that would be one thing, but it's so damaging to the church when these make their way within the fellowship. And so uh, he has been, been warning them. And we made it as far as verse 10. But like I said, I just want to pick up from the, from the beginning and, and, uh, and just kind of make our way through again. And in verses 1 through 4, he gives his greeting and his purpose. He says, this is Jude, I'm a bondservant, a slave of Jesus Christ, and brother to James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Let me say one thing really quick. I got a text about this, like on Monday morning. What translation are you using? My translation said something different for verse 1. Anybody else have that same experience uh, here today? That it doesn't have, I mean, maybe you have a different translation, but you can tell, oh, that's the same. But maybe it doesn't say the called, sanctified, and preserved. It says something different. Anybody in here have a Bible that says something different? I think, yeah, a couple of you? Okay, yeah, it, it, pro, it very well may say the called, beloved, and preserved. Um, and that's just, you know, there's two main tracks of, uh, of translation, of manuscripts used for translations. And there are translations like the King James, the New King James, um, and some translations take this track and other ones take this track. There are such minor differences in, uh, I will say this over and over and over again, the best translation. You guys ready for this to jot this down? The best translation is the one that you read. <laughs> read the Bible. That's the best translation. If it's, I don't care if it's NIV, ESV, New King James, read the Bible. That's the best translation, the one that you read. So there are some minor differences in there, but it doesn't change the message. But he says, hey, this is written by me uh, to Christians. And, and again, he says they're called, sanctified, or beloved, and preserved. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Jude wants these traits to define the believers and have the fruit of the Spirit, not just added in their life, but abounding in their life, multiplied in their life, mercy, peace, and love. And, and to those of us who are here on Sunday or watched online, you know this is a serious book. He is going to be broaching a very serious matter, and he paints what you could describe as a very bleak picture. He's very graphic descriptions. He's going to compare the danger and the doom of false teachers in the church to Israelites, millions of Israelites that died in the wilderness, to the destruction of falling angels and the whole world being flooded. But still, he says, in the face of this threat, in the face of, of, of that kind of situation, here's what should be abounding in your life. Not complaining, not this, not, you know, legalism, not any of those things. But he says, man, this is what I want. Mercy, peace, and love. This is what should be coming out of your life, even in the midst of a trying time, even in the midst of a threat and a dangerous situation. He says you should be growing in these areas. And so that's the, the who. He explains his goals in writing the letter in verses 3 and 4. He says, beloved, well, I was very diligent to write you concerning the com our common salvation I found it necessary to write you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith 
which was once for all delivered to the saints. I was going to write you about this salvation that we share, but instead, man, I just felt it was imperative. I didn't feel like I had that option necessarily, but or it took a different direction. I got to encourage you to, to fight. I got to tell you, that there is truth that needs to be fought for. And this word earnestly contend, it literally means put up a fight. I'm calling you to put up a fight. Why? He says, for certain men. There's distinct men. Certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for condemnation. Ungodly men. Hey, for those of you who mark your Bible, uh, maybe as we're going along, notice how many times the word ungodly is used in this one chapter here. It is a, a lot. That, that is something that he wants us to get across is that these false teachers, if they're nothing else, they're ungodly. He says they've crept in unnoticed. They've been long ago marked out for this. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to write about this, but I realized, man, I need to write about uh, invasion, not about salvation. There's those who have crept into the church. They're undermining the truths of church. They're redefining the, the basic core principles of what it means to be in the faith. And that the danger is not just that they're out there. If they're just out there making noise, that's one thing. But the danger is that they're going to be taking others with them. And so he says these false teachers are ungodly. They, they, uh, they consider God's grace permission to sin. And ultimately, he says they deny the lordship of Jesus. And he says they're in the church. I need to sound the alarm. I need to exhort the church. Keep fighting. Stand up for the truth. Put up a fight for it. It's worth fighting for because they've come in unnoticed. Unnoticed by you, but noticed by God. They have been marked out for condemnation. Know this, that, that it's not, you may be oblivious to what's going on, but the Lord is not oblivious. He knows that they are in the church and their judgment is certain. They're going to reap what they've sown. And then he gives three examples of apostasy from the past. These certain men are like certain unbelieving Israelites during the wilderness. Verse five, he says, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. For, for those who, you know, um, maybe don't understand uh, the, the backstory of what he's referencing here, it can almost sound like God's being moody. God's not moody. He didn't miraculously lead the Israelites out of Egypt and lead them into the desert for most of them to die. What destroyed them was their unbelief that they wouldn't believe. And that unbelief was spurred on by just a handful of apostates, a handful of those who are misleading the majority. And again, a lot of you guys are aware of it. After leaving Egypt, the Israelites came to this place called Kadesh Barnea. It's right on the edge of the promised land. And 12 spies were sent into the land to kind of take inventory of sorts. And all 12 agreed that the land is beyond their expectations. It's amazing. It's fantastic. All 12 also agreed that there are giants in the land, okay? Two of the 12, Josh and Caleb said, let's roll, let's go. They're bigger, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, man. I'm, oh, let's go for it. God's on our side. The other 10, they focused on the size of the problem instead of the size of the solution, instead of the size of their God. And so even though God had already led them through the Red Sea and given them manna and water from the rock, they refused to believe that God would provide for them here. They, they wouldn't trust the Lord in this. And that's one thing, again, if it was just these 10 guys that did it, but these 10 guys stood up there and they drew the entire nation into a place of unbelief. That's serious. They're the cause of death of millions of people out there in the wilderness. And so um, they, they only died there in the wilderness. Uh, and then illustration number two, verse six, certain fallen angels, angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Again, this is something that, man, maybe we can discuss and, and talk about later if you have a hard time wrapping your mind around it. Maybe you were here on Sunday or watched online or whatever, but um, uh, those who had re angels who initiated relationships with humans leading up to the flood, they didn't keep their proper domain. They didn't stay within the boundaries that the Lord had for them. And they were actively working to corrupt humanity and uh, their judgment was certain. Certain men 
um, these certain angels, and now uh, the pagans. As verse 7, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So his second angel... Again, is is a second angel. His second example was angels corrupting humanity leading up to the flood. But if you remember in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's the it's the men of the city trying to corrupt the angels. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 19, these two angels came to Sodom and Lot said, Hey, why don't you come to my place? And they said, No, we're gonna spend the night in the open square. And Lot it's like, that does not sound like a good idea. I've been to the open square after dark. It's not safe. He convinces them to come over. And then it says, now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, it was just pervasive. All the people, it says, from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. They almost broke down the door. And finally, the angels are like, okay, we're here to take you out of this situation. You think you took us out of the city square? We're here to take you out of this city because it's going to get destroyed. And the Lord took him away and the fire came down. And Jude says, that's a foreshadowing of the judgment that awaits false teachers. What they experienced in Sodom and Gomorrah being obliterated, uh, man, that's going to happen to these false teachers who are leading people away, trying to corrupt, trying to convince them, you know, to, to be immoral and do their own thing. And he says there, there's certain men like these three examples today. And so he gives some of their characteristics. Verse eight, there you go. Also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitary. They're dreamers. Again, um, the, the, the consensus among commentators is that it's talking about those who would, um, uh, maybe you've heard like the Oracle of Delphi or something, that, that they'd look dr into dreams and visions and be directed, uh, you know, that way in life. And, and regardless of whether it's contrary to Scripture, man, we have this super spiritual experience and it can be trusted and you should follow up. So they're dreamers, he says. That's a characteristic of them. And then he says they define filed the flesh. They're, they're living for carnality, like those angels. We want to know them carnally. All, all we're about is the flesh. And so, so often we see this today, the false teachers, those who are like this, man, they want bigger ministries and bigger cars and bigger boats and bigger egos and more power, more influence. Just, yeah, gimme, gimme, gimme. They, uh, they defile the flesh. And third, he says they reject authority. They don't want to be accountable. They, they are their greatest authority. No one's going to tell them what to do. And their, their disdain for authority is so complete. He points out they speak evil of dignitaries. Yet, verse 9, Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil... When he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not to bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Not, man, I rebuke you, and I'm Michael the archangel, or I claim this body, but I'm going to let Jesus deal with you, okay? So there's these uh, present-day uh, apostles are following in these footsteps, and they're too proud, they're too arrogant, very much like that. It says in verse 10, they speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like blue, brute, blute, brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. They pretend to be spiritual, they're just living for the flesh, they're natural. And so he says, man, these guys have come into the church, and if God's people begin to follow their example, that's super dangerous, because they're then opening themselves up for judgment. If they follow, if you follow someone off a cliff, you go off a cliff too. It's not just that person that faces the consequences. And so Jude sees this as a very real threat that meant to those who are leading in this direction. He says in verse 11, woe to them. And we read woe to them. We, in the Bible, man, it's watch out. This is serious. Woe. Certain judgment is coming to these certain men. And then he goes on to cite 
three Old Testament ex- more three more Old Testament examples. It's one thing I love about the book of Jude is it takes you literally all over the Bible. Jude knew the Bible. He implemented the Bible in talking and instructing and teaching others. And I think that's a great example for us. But he said, for they have gone the way of Cain. They've run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And they followed these three examples, Cain and Balaam and Korah and all of these Old Testament examples. I said, it's just another value for us. I hope we know these names. And if not, I hope we're, we're diligent in wanting to learn these names. You know, there's a verse that if you're regular with us on Wednesday night, I quote quite often. And that's Romans 15 verse 4. It says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning that through the patience and comfort of Scripture, we might have hope. These things are written for us. They're not just dry facts. They're written to encourage us, to comfort us, to grow us. And these Old Testament stories and accounts that Jude brings to our attention, he says, I want you to see these as examples, as these as, as pictures of warning to grow and mature us as we're dealing with false teachers as well. And so he says, example number one is they go the way of Cain. Cain's story, again, he goes all the way back to the very beginning. is found in Genesis chapter four. Both he and his brother Abel brought offerings to the Lord. Abel took a lamb, the firstborn lamb of the flock, and Cain presented the fruit of his hands. He brought some produce from the garden. He was a farmer. And it says the Lord accepted Abel's offering of the lamb, but rejected Cain's offering. And we got to say, well, why, why was it rejected? Why would, he, why would he do that? They both brought an offering, and it seems as though as we study Scripture that the Lord had already instructed from the very beginning, from the moment of the fall, even though it's not recorded in Genesis chapter 3, that sacrifices needed to be made for sin. The very first death as a result of sin in the Bible was so that an animal that was killed to cover the fact that Adam and Eve had sinned. And so, and the Lord did that. The Lord is the one that gave that example. And so it would seem as though it was rejected because Cain Cain should have known that, you know, but Cain had some, some other things going on in his life. Hebrews chapter 12, again, tells us that Abel, it says, brought the firstborn of his, his flock, and it was an act of faith. He did that as an act of faith, as an act of, Lord, this is a picture of the covering that you provide. But it goes on to say that Cain didn't. He did his own thing. He brought his sacrifice in disobedience and, and disbelief. And it says, following that in Genesis chapter 4, that Cain was angry. It says his countenance fell. You can just picture that such a descriptive term, his countenance fell, all his features go down. When your features are down, that's angry, right? And you're up, his were down. And the Lord, man, he's seen this about him, seen this in his heart. And he told him in Genesis 4, he says, Cain, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. I love that grace that the Lord extended to Cain. You brought me an offering. You knew that's not what I had intended. You you let an anger control you. But man, there's grace here. I'm going to show you the way out of that. But Cain didn't master it. He didn't control it. He let jealousy and envy control him. Sin mastered him. And so the, the irony of Cain's life is he went from essentially being unwilling to shed the blood of a sacrifice to willing to shed his brother's blood. Man, I'm going to sacrifice you to my to my God. It's me. It's myself because I want to do things my way. First John three. For those of you who take notes, uh, First John three eleven and twelve says this: You heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Cain was evil. 
He rejected God's instruction. He rejected God's authority. He refused the Lord's advice. And the way of Cain is to encourage others to do the very same and to approach God in a way that's not biblical. And so do things their own way. So that's the way of Cain. Example number two. And again, we, t- we touched on this just a few short weeks ago in 2 Peter chapter 2 is Balaam. Balaam's story is towards the, uh, the end of the book of Numbers, like 22 through chapters 22 through 25. And Balaam was a prophet for hire. He was someone who would say things and, and prophesy things for financial gain. And his heart was not after the Lord. He did what he did to get rich. And it wasn't about being right. And he also, um, he instructed the king of Moab, whose name was Balak, how to entice the Israelites into sinning. And so, uh, like Balaam, these false, certain men that he's talking about, these false teachers that are leading others into sin for their own purposes, their own, uh, so they can get ahead. And then third example is he mentions the rebellion of Korah. Korah's story also, now he goes back to Numbers, Numbers chapter 16. Uh, after he was one of those who left Egypt miraculously. He, Korah's feet walked through the bottom of the Red Sea. He picked manna off the ground and ate it miraculously and drank water himself from the rock, um, but he didn't like the chain of command. Now, that's all good. That's all great, but he wanted to be in charge. And here's the thing is that if you go back and you look at it, Korah was a Levite. He was of a very esteemed tribe. He was part of the Kohathite clan. And uh, there was three, so there's the Levites, and then there's three clans under the Levites, and they each had responsibilities going through the wilderness, things to carry, things to do. And the Kohathites, Korah's clan, as part of the Levites, was to carry and move and set up the instruments and the things found within the tabernacle. So he's moving the menorah, he's moving the table of showbread, he's moving the Ark of the Covenant, all of this, and he's like, well, this isn't enough for me. I want to be in charge. Carrying this stuff through the desert, maybe someone else can carry this for a while. Maybe I could offer the sacrifices. He didn't want to follow the way that God had prescribed the chain of command and authority. And the example that he's using is is these, they lead others away. And Korah did too. He gathered 250 men to kind of join this posse that rallied against Moses and Aaron and rejected their authority and said, we should be in charge. Moses' response, as, as we read a lot of times um, in, in, uh, in, in Exodus and uh, Numbers and, and Deuteronomy, is his response is prayer. He just fell in his face. Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Here's these guys that are challenging my authority, challenging Aaron's authority. And so he face planted and he called Korah and his crew to come. He says, go ahead, offer incense, and we'll let the Lord decide, you know. And the Lord says, okay, um, can I get you all to back up just a little bit here and leave Korah out there? <laughs> And the ground swallowed him up, right? Took care of him. And so these, these examples, Cain, Balaam, Korah, Judah says, if, Judah, Jude says, that was his name was Judah. Jude says, if you look very closely, they're following in those exact same footprints. They've got those same traits as Cain. I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to get angry if the Lord tells me to do it a different way. Uh, they follow the example of Balaam. Man, I'm in it for myself. I don't really care. I'll do whatever. I'll say whatever as long as, you know, it's, it's good for me. And follow the example of Korah. Man, I don't, I don't know about this chain of command thing. I want to be in charge. I want to make the decisions. And he says, those people are around today, and they're within the, in the church. And, uh, and so that's who these wolves are like. But now... Jude uses five pictures from nature of what they're like. That's who they're like. This is what they're like. 
I think Jude is an outdoorsman. He says in verse 12, there's spots in your love fests, feasts uh, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. First of all, there's spots. Now, here's what's interesting. Uh, that, that's pretty descriptive in and of itself, but that word actually is used to describe hidden rocks just under the surface, like a, like a ship that's thinking it's navigating successfully along the shore until suddenly it's undermined by something right under the surface. It's right there. It wasn't aware of it. And he says, what they're doing is they're undermining your, your love feast, the, these agape feasts, this common meal. Maybe we'd call it a potluck, okay? But they, it was meant to be this time of giving and receiving, but their only concern was feeding themselves. And they were in fellowship. They were part of the fellowship to only see what they could get out of it. He says, man, that's right under the surface. Man, it's right there. Not, not only are there spots, they are clouds without water carried about by the winds. They're, they're storm clouds that bring, bring darkness and destruction, but no rain. There's no rain to them. They promise to refresh, but they don't. It's like, it's like a tornado. They just, they, they, they just, if they just drifted in and left, that'd be one thing, but they, they, they're, they leave you dry and they're carried about by these winds. And this word here means violent wind. It's in middle of summer Ellensburg type of wind, tornado-ish wind. And so this blessing and refreshment that we'd hope would come doesn't follow them. Instead of refreshment coming, there's destruction that is born out of these guys in their path. So there's spots, there are clouds. Third, there are late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Now, the Bible says that you will know them by their fruit. And in, in, in John 15, fruit is the result of being in communion with Jesus. These guys have no fruit. It's late fall. They've had ample opportunities, multiple opportunities presented to bear fruit, produce something that's of value to someone else. That's what fruit is, but there's nothing. They're dead on top because they're dead at the source. They're, they're, they're pulled out. They're pulled up by the roots. They're not being nourished themselves, and so they cannot bring nourishment to someone else. It's like, it's like Psalm 1, right, being planted by rivers of water, bearing fruit in and out of season. Man, if, if the tree's nourished, that's the man of God. The man of the word is nourished by the word, then he's going to bear fruit in his life. They don't have that. They're, they're pulled up by the roots. Fourth, he says, they're raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Such a vivid illustration. He says, like the ocean, man, they're, they're busy, right? They're, they've just been out to the shore, right? It's just there's constant motion. There's tossing and turning. He says, raging waves. Man, maybe there's destruction on the way towards its destination, but when it comes to its end and it finally reaches the, its end and, and pulls back, what's left? Foam, sea foam. You guys have been out there. All that's, all that's deposited, even by a big raging storm that's tossing up all sorts of things, all that's left is junk. It's seaweed, driftwood, trash. That's all that's left. So there's a lot of motion, a lot of commotion, but all that's left, man, is they reveal who they really are. It's just foam, foaming up their own shame. Spots, clouds, trees, raging waves, and wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's so ominous. They're shooting stars. That's what he's referring to when he says wandering stars. They're, sh they're shooting stars. I love shooting stars, right? Man, you're, you're out there like, no, that's a satellite. It's just like, you know, but a shooting star, that'll catch your attention. It's, it's dramatic. It comes on the scene with a flash, like, look at me, look at this. But, but there's no substance. That's how they're coming on the scene. Lots of commotion, drawing lots of attention. But what, what, what comes of them, what comes of the shooting star, it turns into the blackness itself. 
That's actually what it becomes, is blackness. He says, this is the future of all false teachers and all apostates, is that if they come with their own agenda, do their own thing, self-serving, hurting people along the way, man, judgment is coming. It is certain. They're reserved for the blackness of darkness forever. And that's what he explains going forward in verses 15, 14 and 15. Now, Enoch, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, about these men, these certain false prophets. Enoch did. Enoch's life, again, back to Genesis, the following chapter after it talks about Cain and Abel. Genesis 5, he's the father of Methuselah. I said it has, he had Methuselah when he was 65 years old, and then he walked with God for 300 years. And it's always so unique to me when you're reading through that. He says he, he was, became the father of Methuselah, and then he walked with God. And if you're a parent, you get that. Man, there's something about having a kid. It's like, man, I got Man, I got to get serious about my life, right? I have a huge responsibility that I have here. And again, but he lived in this leading up kind of a, a bridge between Adam. He would have been alive at the time of Adam and uh, leading up to the ark, this incredibly wicked time with all sorts of nonsense going on. But he walked with God, it says. And then he went on to have other sons and daughters. But for those 300 years, he walked with the Lord. And then it says the Lord took him. One of two people in scripture to not die. The other was Elijah taken up in a chariot of fire. But Jude tells us that, man, we may not know much about Enoch from Genesis 5 other than the fact he had Methuselah, uh, you know, when he was 65, walked with God for 300 years and the Lord took him. But now we have new information found nowhere else in scripture is that he was prophesying. He was warning people all the way back then in Genesis chapter 5, that God deals with the wicked, that no one gets away with anything. And so this is how he was prophesying. Verse 14 continues. This is what he said. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they've committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, prophecy of Enoch. What is all of this about? Where I've just looked at the table of contents. I can't find a book of Enoch anywhere. Is there a book of Enoch out there? Is there this prophecy? It, it's not in the Bible, Okay? And that's okay. That's all right. That something mentioned in the Bible is not in the Bible. Just because Jude quotes Enoch, who was a great man who walked with the Lord and was taken by him, doesn't mean that everything that Enoch said should be in Scripture. It doesn't mean that. Paul quoted, on, in Acts chapter 17, he quoted uh, Greek cultural references when he was teaching there in Athens. And he quoted the philosopher and poet to Titus in Titus chapter 1. He quotes Epimenides was his name as saying this. He says, quote, Epimenides said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That's in uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 12. And then Paul adds this. That's what Epimenides said about people who live in Crete. Then Paul adds, this testimony is true. Uh, he's spot on, man. Those guys are, man, they're liars. That's who they are, man. You're, Titus, you're there ministering there. This is a tough group. You got your hands full with these guys. But it doesn't mean, just because he quoted this philosopher that lived 6th century BC, doesn't mean that everything that Epimenides said is true. Paul quoted somebody that he knew his audience would understand to validate his point, to prove his point. He used a cultural reference for that, and that's okay, and that's all that Jude does here. Now, the book of Enoch does exist. It can be found. Fragments of it were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the book of Enoch itself was not in Jewish scriptures throughout the Old Testament. It wasn't part of Jewish scriptures leading up to Jesus' day. And it was not part of Jewish scripture in Jude's day. Jewish tradition would say that, man, it's considered interesting, but it's not scripture, 
Okay? So it's not in the Jewish Bible. It's also not in the Catholic Bible. Some of y'all have heard of the Apocrypha. There are books in the Catholic Bible that are not in ours. There's 12 uh, additional books, uh, Tobit and Wisdom and 1st, 2nd, 3rd, um, Maccabees, um, Ezra 1 and 2. There's just these 12 extra books within the Catholic Bible. Now, what you may not know, I don't want to get too sidetracked here though, is that these books that were added to Catholic Bibles were added in, in the scope of Scripture. They're added relatively recently. They, they hadn't been there for a long time. The Council of Trent was held by the Catholic Church in response to to what was taking place in the Reformation. And so they met from the years eight, or excuse me, 1545 to 1563 and said, okay, the Reformation is taking place. Luther has his 95 thesis. Here's how we're going to respond. And in that response, this well thought out year long council is the fact that they added these 12 books of the Apocrypha to Catholic Bibles. The book of Enoch isn't there either. And I'm saying all of this is because there is a lot today that, you know, because everybody has this innate thing in them that they want to have this deeper spirituality, this deeper level of understanding. And traditional organized church doesn't have it, but there might be this thing out there, right? A lot of folks have that super prevalent. And one of the ways that that manifests itself is people talk about these extra biblical texts. Oh, did you know the book of Enoch says this? Why are they keeping this out of the Bible? This is just a plan. Oh, there's the book of Thomas. Did you know Thomas wrote a book? And, and so these things are sometimes presented as, oh, you can go a little bit deeper. And really, gosh, uh, that's all part of like this same type of Gnostic heresy that was going around in Jesus' day. There's a deeper level with visions and all of this. There's always something deeper if you just, if you just do this. And that's what people can do with this book of Enoch. But the book of Enoch has never been a part of Jewish scripture. It's not a part of Catholic scripture. And it's never been a part of the Bible on your laps. Now, you can find the book of Enoch online, and you could read it if you want, and it is interesting. It's 36 very short chapters. Some of them are like two verses long. Uh, you can consider it an interesting read, but by no means, my friend, should you consider it scripture, okay? So there it is. That part is true. Enoch said this. He said, the Lord comes with 10,000 saints to execute judgment in all to convict all around godly man. And that's what we're going to be seeing in the book of Revelation. God's going to judge sin. He's serious about it. Enoch's, Enoch's been saying it from the very beginning. One other thing, remember what happened with Enoch though? He walked with God and he was no more. And then what's the, the event that took place immediately following after Enoch was taken away? Go ahead and say it. The flood that God's judgment came after Enoch, who walked with God, was taken away. And I believe that same pattern is going to be, be the seen in the church. Those who walk with God are going to be taken away, and then judgment is going to come. Anyway, um, verse 16, Jude gives us one more list of character traits of the false teachers. Um, as a negative example, it's just they're grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts and their mouths, great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. What a sorry description of anyone. I was looking at these things. I would, no one wants to hang out with someone like this, but they are influential and they can be powerful. They're grumblers, selfish, exaggerating, self-serving, Man, he says, that's them. That's, that's what they're like. But for us, here's our calling, verse 17. But you, beloved, that's who you are. You are beloved by the Lord. Beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. Mockers are going to mock and they're going to criticize and they're within the church, but here's what you do. Okay, enough looking at those guys, beloved. Here's what you do. 
Number one, remember the words. Beloved, remember the words. Keep coming back to the word. How do you contend for your faith? That's what all this is about. That's what the call is. Here's how you do. How do you identify and deal with false teachers? Stay in the word. Know the book. It's a call on every single one of our lives. I've never seen a strong, stable, mature, and confident believer who wasn't consistently in the Bible. Because I don't think they exist. Be in the word. Remember the word. They're, they're sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Man, that's, that's them. They're, they, they're just sensual. They're in it for the flesh. And they cause division because there's always, if you're just sensual, if you're looking to please self, you're prideful, there's no unity. Pride and unity don't get along. It causes division. Pride causes division. And so they're divisive. They only want to get what they want. And Jude just says point blank because they, they don't have the spirit. But you, that's who they are. But you, he says again, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Point two, praying. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Stay in the word and stay in prayer. If you want resistance to those who could tarnish you, to could lead you away, who want to be just under the surface and, and cause a shipwreck in you. Man, stay in fellowship with God by hearing him through his word and, and communicating with him through prayer. That communication, keep those lines of communication going back and forth. Notice what he says next in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. If you're in the word, if you're in the prayer, I believe that you're going to stay in the love of God, but stay connected to the vine, obeying him, submitting to him, hearing from him, following his leading, loving because he first loved us, understanding all that. Stay in the word, stay in prayer, stay in the love of God and stay looking for Jesus. He says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Everything is transitory. Everything comes and goes, but heaven is certain and heaven awaits and it's ours because Jesus is merciful to us. Man, I want you to be resistant to false teachers. So stay close to him. Be looking to him. Be looking as the author of Hebrews says, to the author and the perfecter of our faith. I just want to be close to you, Lord. I'm so grateful for you, what you've done in my life, what you want to do in my life. I'm just going to keep my eyes focused on you. And as I do, man, all the way to eternity, I'm just looking to you. And stay evangelizing. Pass that mercy along. Verse 22. On some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. Stay evangelizing. Some folks need to be corrected clearly and directly. It needs to happen, man. Straight out of the fire. You are headed towards hell, and I am here to stop you. I don't want you to go. On others, man, some others need redirection. They need some compassion. Maybe they're doubting. Maybe they're asking sincere questions questions. He says, man, you need to make this distinction, but stay evangelizing because they all need to be pulled out of the fire. So stay in the word, stay in prayer. This is the calling that each of us have to fight for the faith. Stay in the word, stay in prayer, stay in the love of God, stay looking for Jesus and stay evangelizing. Now, Let's stand. I went a little longer than I expected, but let's stand. I'm going to read these last two beautiful, wonderful verses. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless. He doesn't say you are faultless, <laughs> but he can present you that way. Praise God, he can. Oh man, our Jesus can present us faultless. That's, that's a miracle. Because you know you, <laughs> he ain't faultless, but he can present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever.